Section 18 of Magna Carta Commemoration Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. Financial Records of the Reign of King John by Hilary Jenkinson. Part 4. Turning to the question of the contents of these rolls, we may say at once, that they do not differ generically from the English ones, so that the two sets may be treated together. Taking, then, the Norman and English chancery rolls, which are of direct exchequer interest, we may divide them into two classes, called for convenience liberate rolls and fine rolls. The first of these classes contains entries of writs of liberate for payments at the exchequer, as also some writs of pardon, of computate, and of allocate, addressed to that department. The fine rolls, alternatively called oblata in early times, contain entries of the sums paid to the king, so-and-so dot domino regi, so much to obtain various privileges, licenses, and exemptions. The ways in which the scope of this roll was developed and modified later need not here detain us. Our exchequer interest in the two classes resolves itself into two questions. One, how far do these rolls relate to the business of the exchequer, and how far to that of the camera? 2. How was the information in them imparted to exchequer officials? Let us take the fine rolls first. These rolls are certainly compiled in the chancery, not the exchequer. This is made clear by plenty of notes such as, Hinc mitendum in sacarium. It is equally clear that certain entries, at least, have a definite sacarium interest, and we have references to the pipe roll. It is clear again that the documents used by the exchequer were not our rolls, but copies, for we get such a note as this. Finis iste non debit miti ad sacarium hic quia mititur superius. Moreover, it appears that in spite of the dot domino and the title of the earlier rolls, rotulus obularum, or finium receptorum, the money was not always, at any rate, paid on the spot. This appears by the following among a number of entries. Cives London dot domino regi tria milia macarum pro habenda confirmatione, et carta liberabitur, Galfrido filio petri per sic, quad si ila, volunt dare suam cartam, habebunt si non autum cartam non Habebunt. On the other hand, the interest of the fine roll entries is not always for the exchequer, for we have such notes as non mititur quia foresta, and if the dat or the receptorum ever have a literal meaning, it is difficult to see how the exchequer could need or profit by information concerning the entries on these rolls, unless we are to make the difficult assumption that the chancery staff were at this date subjected to audit. We may perhaps make tentatively the suggestion that entries upon the fine rolls fall into two rough classes of cash payments and promises, only the latter engaging the attention of the exchequer. This opens up possibilities too wide for discussion here, though we may perhaps say a word on the subject later in connection with the camera. Like the other printed volumes of John Records, the fine rolls offer scope for a careful reading and analysis. In conclusion, we have to add to the known fine rolls what is, though rough and written on an unusually narrow membrane, undoubtedly the fragment of a fine roll of the twelfth year of John, 1210. It came originally from the treasury of the receipt, but it is not unknown for chancery records to be found in the repository. It is now among the miscellanea of the exchequer, K.R. 1, number 5. Turning now to the second of the classes of chancery rolls to which we alluded above, the liberate, we have to deal with three Norman rolls proper, one Norman roll which forms the April section of the English liberate roll for the second year of John, and English liberate rolls of the second, third, and fifth years. Further, it is generally admitted that this series is continued by the close rolls, which begin, as has already been noticed, with the sixth year. It is possible that the loss of Normandy and the elimination of the necessity for a double series of liberate rolls and double reference to two exchequers had something to do with the innovation. If we include the close rolls in the division we are now considering, 
The principal question facing us is what parts of the contents of the rolls would interest the exchequer. Now the contents of the Liberate rolls proper are writs of which the originals, by their nature, are bound either to be found in the exchequer at the time of audit, or to be produced there by accountants. The only use for the chancery records of these, so far as the exchequer is concerned, is that mentioned in the Dialogus, the checking of the originals by means of the Contra Briuia, or Rescripta, which themselves, not in the shape of secondary copies, are brought over by the Chancellor or his clerk. It is by no means impossible that, in contradistinction to the fine rolls, the actual Liberate rolls still preserved to us among John's Chancery rolls themselves visited the Exchequer. Certain annotations upon them may even have been made in the Exchequer. If the Chancery Liberate rolls were periodically sent over in this way, it would account for the fact that no Exchequer enrollments of these writs have come down to us for the John period. It was not till the receipt officials came to make rolls for their own convenience that such an enrollment came to be thought desirable. To the Liberate rolls, then, representing the rescriptum of the Dialogus, we see added to our period, e.g. in Norman Roll 5, entries of terra liberate, that is, copies of letters which indirectly interested the Norman exchequer. Similarly, in the English Liberate Roll 3, we have the title Rotulus Terrarum et Denariorum Liberatorum in Anglia. Once again, then, I think we have here, as in the case of the receipt rolls mentioned above, the exchequer, interest originating the keeping of rolls in another department. This other department speedily finds out the convenience of preserving such records for its own purposes, and we have added to them copies of documents, in the present case other letters, close or patent, which are not, in some cases, even indirectly of audit interest. From this the transition would probably soon be made, in the case of the Chancery, to an ordered treatment of the subject from a Chancery point of view, and we then get, added, the idea of originalia, or estrites, made specially for the benefit of the Exchequer, and incorporating transcripts from the fine rolls, with less numerous items from the close rolls and the patent and charter rolls. It is not improbable that the duplicates surviving to us in the classes of both fine and close rolls of the John period are relics of the transition stage, but here again is a subject too detailed to be dealt with in the present paper. We have, in fact, in the time of John, at first, two distinct collections being made by the Chancery. One, enrollments of charters and letters patent, of which letters copies were preserved for the purposes of the Chancery. Two, liberate, preserved primarily for exchequer purposes. As this second class merged into the close rolls, the chancery interest in the preservation of record of letters close became equal, at least, to that of the exchequer. The stage before this is possibly responsible partly for the lack of exactitude which we sometimes notice in the early rolls in the assignment of a letter of one or the other kind to its proper class of enrollment. We have left, till the last, the most thorny of all the questions connected with early financial records. Contemporary reference gives us, as administrative instruments, the Sacarium, the Thesaurus, the Recepta, the Camera, and the Garderoba. What are all these, and what their relations, one to another? Various writers have touched upon this one and that, and have even alluded to points in their relationship. Thus, Professor McKitchney suggests that, though the audit was fixed at Westminster, the Exchequer, in which he includes, presumably, the Upper Exchequer and the Recepta, with much of its impedimentia of writs and tallies, would accompany the King. Delisle, speaking of Norman affairs, says, La chambre suivant le prince, le trésor, restrait en dépôt et un château, filets or cane. Professor Powicki, dealing with the Norman Exchequers, speaks of the English Exchequer Chamber so far as that did not follow the King. In dealing ourselves, so far, with existing Exchequer records, we have been able to trace in John's reign a number of the series of Exchequer records which are familiar to us at a later period and to trace, too, something of their relationship to each other and to the most important of all, the pipe roll. We have even ventured to suggest what were some of the matters of difficulty the points of pressure and congestion in the old, simple system of receipt, expenditure, and audit, and in the records of these processes, 
and consequently what signs of development and growth we may look for in our period both in the system and in the records. We have refrained, however, so far from an attempt to fit King John's known financial transactions, as they are reflected in innumerable instances in, for example, his chancery rolls, into this or that part of the machinery we were able to outline. We have been content, that is, to allude to the fact that the pipe roll and other machinery does deal with some financial matters while others pass it by, without attempting either to classify the first of these or to collect concrete instances of the second. Unfortunately, we have financial records still to deal with which touch the second of these classes, the mise and prestita rolls, which are undoubtedly concerned with some transactions that are outside the normal course of the exchequer and the normal pipe, memoranda, receipt, and issue records. We are driven, therefore, in conclusion to touch upon the record evidence for the administration of financial matters which did not come within the influence of the upper exchequer. We have already suggested that because a matter was not subject to audit, there is no reason that the receipt and issue side of it should not be controlled by the lower exchequer, whose business these processes were. Unfortunately, the paucity of records of this department for John's reign does not permit us to prove or disprove the suggestion that the receipt was still giving itself little trouble over matters of which the pipe roll scribes did not take cognizance. In opening this matter, it is necessary to distinguish not so much between the camera and the sacarium as between the camera and the curia. It is to be remembered that the curia is originally the personal entourage of the king, the camera only appears when the curia has been professionalized and departmentalized, supplying that personal element which the curia had lost. Thus, in administration, when the king's secretary has become the department or court of chancery, there arises a new personal secretary, a member, as the chancellor had originally been, of the king's household staff. Similarly, the treasurer, departmentalized, is replaced from the personal point of view by the keeper of the king's private accounts, in the contemporary phrase, keeper of his wardrobe. We have to note first, then, that the camera is not a purely financial affair. It is the successor of the curia in the position of the king's personal entourage. All kinds of duties, certainly secretarial as well as financial ones, may be undertaken by it. The unfortunate anomaly of John's reign is that the chancellor has not been departmentalized, whereas the treasurer has so that we have this member of the curia still following the king and, in effect, a member of the camera. Later he will be replaced there by the keeper of the privy seal, but at present that instrument is no more than a signet ring which the king uses, normally, in much the same way as any private person. We may now attempt some distinction between the financial terms mentioned at the beginning of this section. In the first place, the sacarium, apart from its literal sense, should undoubtedly be a season, an occasion, the occasion or season of audit. Unfortunately, there seems little doubt that in early times, while this is the generally accepted sense, the word is sometimes used loosely. Maddox has collected together several instances of what appear to be local sicaria, according to him, some subordinate receipts or places of revenue, with which he classes the sicarium redemptionis regis ricardi and the Sicarium Aronis, which dealt with the debts of Aaron of Lincoln, and also the Sicarium Hugonis de Neville, to which a certain debtor was ordered to pay seven hundred pounds, on the understanding that Hugh de Neville would account for the sum afterwards at the Sicarium Westmonasterii. Most of the instances given might be explained as being special occasions, but this last of Hugh de Ville is difficult. We may add to it a reference to John's Sicarium de Merleberg at Easter, 1207. The payments which are ordered to be made there appear to some extent in the normal pipe roll of the following Michaelmas, so that we might suppose that on this occasion the Easter exchequer sat, exceptionally, away from Westminster. We have to add to this, however, that a little later on, in July 1215, Hugh de Neville was keeper of the king's thesaurus at Marlborough, that the small so-called Receipt roll mentioned above is a short list of sums received de Balavis Hugonis de Neville, unde responsum est ad sacarium, and that in the pipe roll of the tenth year we have a compotus Hugonis de Neville, de recepta sua. 
It is possible that we may draw from these passages the inference that yet another expedient was tried during our period for the relief of the overworked exchequer, an extension of the principle of compotus and particulars in the shape of supplementary provincial exchequers whose activities were summarized at the audit at the Sicarium Westmonsterii. Be that as it may, it is clear that we must be prepared for the use of the word Sicarium in exceptional cases in a sense closely similar to that of thesaurus. About the function of the thesaurus there is no ambiguity. Its business is the custody of treasure, including records. It frequently follows the king, but sometimes he deposits its contents in some place which is considered safe, such as the Abbey of Reading. On the other hand, it sometimes remains apparently in places difficult of access. It is possible that the term was applied to more than one depot of treasure, for we have reference to the king's receipt at Shrewsbury of a large sum from our treasury of Marlborough, but this may have been only a temporary localization. Did the officials of the Recepta, who normally controlled the thesaurus, follow the king? If not, there must always have been a thesaurus, though it might be empty, at Westminster. In any case, there is no reason to suppose that the thesaurus, or thesauri, though it, or they, certainly should receive monies paid in, and audited in the old normal way, did not also include any monies the king might have accumulated by other methods. The camera, as well as the sacarium, may have been, so to speak, a depositor. There is no doubt that the king did receive, irregularly, large sums which were paid over to him wherever he might happen to be. This is to say that he received them in camera, in his household. Sometimes they were sums which formed part of a regular pipe roll account, and the barons of the exchequer have to be notified of the receipt. Sometimes they are donna, or fines, many of which certainly did not figure in any known audit. Sometimes they are sums derived from the thesaurus. We have numerous instances of such receipts in camera, or in garderoba. Do these two phrases convey the same thing? Probably the explanation is that anything paid in garderoba was necessarily paid in camera, of which garderoba was only a part. This brings us to the question of the prestita and mise rolls. Of the contents of these rolls we have not space to say much, and indeed their relation and distinction may perhaps be sufficiently illustrated by a single quotation from a prestita roll, Iadem dei ibidem rogero wacalin, de prestito ad nueum suam omnio perandum v marcus praetor donum quad rex ae dedit di al es v marcus cui sunt in rotulo mise the interesting point to us is the question of their place in the general scheme of administration and since the relation to the pipe rolls if there is any cannot be settled with certainty while those records remain unprinted this is largely a question of the persons who produced them to that question there can, I think, be only one answer. Even if relations can be established later upon some points with this acarium, it must remain clear that these rolls were put together in and for the benefit of the king's camera. The prestita are really only a development of the expenditure side of the garderoba, the more normal manifestation of which are the mise. Both are part of the king's personal expenditure, and since the king's personal writing officer was still, as we have seen, the Chancellor with his staff, we can hardly avoid the conclusion that Hardy was right in classing them mise and prestita as chancery records, and that they are incorrectly placed in the exchequer because the latter wardrobe accounts, which they anticipate, went there as a result of the later arrangement by which the wardrobe was made subject to audit. In the chancery they form part of a class, we might conjecture, which on the side of receipts includes the very curious fine and oblata rolls. In this connection, we may conclude with three further citations from the patent rolls, which speak for themselves. 1. Sciatus quad quietum clamavimus delectum et fidelum nostrum Philippum de Lucy de omni prestito quad iae facimus et de omnibus receptus quas recepit dum esset in camera nostra. 2. Litera ista, i.e., Originals of enrollments on the patent roll. Liberate erant in camera Domini Regis Rudolfo Parmentario 
apud craneburn three sciatus quad recipimus permanum r pioris de reading omnis rotulus nostros de camera nostra et sigillum nostrum et rotulus nostras de sacario no doubt the phrase rotulus de camera refers to the mise and prestita but where are the chancery rolls the records of letters which had issued under the sigillum it is tempting to include them also under the same designation for to the camera at this date they did in a sense undoubtedly belong inasmuch as we must hold it to have included that chancellaria which still followed the king a study of the way in which john's cash resources were handled passing from england to normandy from the exchequer official to the soldier from the camera to the recepta would reveal i think the fact that so far as he had them he disposed of them at his will freely he may have lacked both money and men but whatever his servants were they were not his masters similarly behind all the administrative confusion of the reign the loose ends of old processes dying out new ones beginning and tentative ones lapsing we seem to see working a single very powerful administrative brain was that the brain of king john's end of the financial records of the reign of king john and end of magna carta commemoration essays by various authors